Welcome to Truth in History. God's true people, Israel. Revelation of God's plan. Fulfillment of Bible prophecy. Mystery of God shall be finished. Kingdoms become kingdoms of Christ. Truth in History with Charles A. Jennings. Welcome to Truth in History in this special program entitled Christ in the Southern Army. This presentation will help explain the history of the term the Southern Bible Belt. There have been many spiritual revivals in the United States, such as the First Great Awakening, and then the revival which took place under the preaching of George Whitfield when he preached from New England down to the state of Georgia. Also the Second Great Awakening around 1800. And then there was the Cane Ridge revival in western Kentucky. But one such spiritual refreshing in our history came during one of the darkest hours of our existence as a nation. In fact, the Lord saw fit to providentially send this revival to our people during the time when we were the most divided in terms of politics, education, culture, economics, and religious faith. This was during the military conflict that we know as the War for Southern Independence of 1861 to 1865. At this time in our national history, the regions of the North and South were quite different from one another in many ways. For several decades preceding the war, the natural development of these two regions seemed to go in somewhat opposite directions. The South developed as an agrarian and rural society while the North was more industrialized and urban. The Southern political leaders advocated a more traditional interpretation of our national constitution, while the Northern leaders followed a more liberal view. One of the most obvious differences was in the area of religious belief and social philosophy. Some of the established churches and prominent ministers of the North seem to be more influenced by the unscriptural philosophies of deism, pantheism, unitarianism, humanism, and rationalism, which was a carryover from the recent reign of terror of the French Revolution. These philosophies had invaded the educational institutions of Harvard and Yale universities. At this same time, most churches and Christian ministers of the South held to the more traditional Calvinistic view and practice of Scripture that had been passed down from the Protestant Reformation. It just seemed inevitable that the people of these two regions of the same country would eventually come to a parting of the ways, or at least a clash of political, cultural, and religious philosophies. Instead, it came to a head in the form of a military conflict, which resulted in more deaths than all American wars combined. In all American wars, from the Revolutionary War through Vietnam, the total U.S. military casualty count was 639,557. During the war between the states between 1861 and 1865, the total casualty count was 665,850. During this time of national crisis, when seemingly our nation was the most divided, the Lord in His sovereign mercy saw fit to send a mighty spiritual revival to the Confederate Army of the South with such powerful results that it would still be felt to this very day. The spiritual impact of this great revival helped to solidify what we still call the Bible Belt. The revival that took place would affect many of the officers and common soldiers of the three main divisions of the Southern Army, but mainly the Army of Northern Virginia 
of which General Robert E. Lee was the commanding officer. When this army was formed, little did the officers and soldiers realize that they were coming together not only to fight a war, but to experience the greatest supernatural move of Almighty God ever to take place in an active wartime army. With the official authorization of the Confederate government, which allocated thousands of dollars for the purchase of Bibles from the American and British Bible societies, the moral support of President Jefferson Davis and General Robert E. Lee, many pastors and evangelists would hold religious services in the camps while the army was idle during campaigns, immediately before many battles, and even during the heat of battle itself. One of the most prominent chaplains who was mightily used of God in leading soldiers to Christ, J. William Jones, in his book entitled Christ in the Camp, gives the following account as a typical scene when many young men left their homes and loved ones to go places unknown to fight for their country. He writes, An hour before the appointed departure time, that splendid company marched to the depot where an immense crowd had assembled to see them off. An aged minister of the gospel, now gone to his reward, spoke words of earnest counsel and led, to a, led in a fervent prayer that the God of Jacob would go forth with these young men, keep them in the way whither they went, and bring them back to their homes in peace and safety but above all, that He would shield them from the vices of the camp and lead them into paths of righteousness. There were hundreds of chaplains, pastors, and evangelists that were welcome to minister to the soldiers in the camps. The tone of the preaching by the pastors and chaplains in the Army of Northern Virginia was evangelical in nature, as recorded by Dr. Granberry. It stressed eternal things, the claims of God, the worth of the soul, the wages of sin, which is death, and the gift of God, which is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. These were the matter of preaching, the songs, prayers, lay testimonies, and exhortation. In a word, all the exercises were in the same line. There was no stirring up of bad blood no inflaming of malice and revenge. The man of God lifted up not the stars and bars, but the cross, and pressed the inquiry, who among you are on the Lord's side? Reverend Tom J. Stokes, in his letter to his sister, presented his portrayal of the revivals. On April 5, 1864, he wrote that at the close of one meeting, the chaplain invited mourners to the anxious seat. For thirty minutes they came from every part of the great congregation, many with streaming eyes to give the old preacher their hand to ask for prayer from God's people. Men who never shrank in battle from any responsibility came forward weeping. Such is the power of the gospel of Christ when preached in its purity. Born again in the trenches, Revivalism in the Confederate Army by Dr. G. Clinton Prim, Jr. Dr. Granberry goes on to describe the general atmosphere in the many camps when he said, Certainly our soldiers were exposed to severe temptations and deprived of many aids to pious culture, yet grace triumphed over all these disadvantages. Cut off from church and Sunday school, often having no day of sacred rest and little communion of saints, they feared the Lord and thought often upon His name. On every march they carried the well-thumbed Bible and the hard ground on which they lay, without a pillow, bed, or tent, often proved to them a Bethel. They delighted in devotional meetings and were not ashamed to witness for Christ. 
Dr. Prim goes on to record, religion is the theme everywhere. You hear around the campfires at night the sweet songs of Zion. This spirit pervades the whole army. What a change, what a change, when one year ago card playing and profane language seemed to be the order of the day. Now what is the cause of this change? Manifestly the working of God's Spirit. Down through the centuries of time, the atmosphere of the army has been regarded as demoralizing to most men, which has been described in the old proverb, the worse the man, the better the soldier. The same would have been true for General Lee's army of Northern Virginia, except for the overflowing presence of the God of all grace that intervened in the hearts and lives of thousands of men. Among the vices that many of the men engaged in, drunkenness, profanity, gambling, and Sabbath breaking were the most prominent. In spite of these initial chronic sins, Dr. Jones says, But I shall be able to show, on the other hand, that Jesus was in our camps with wonderful power, and that no army in all history, not even Cromwell's roundheads, had in it as much of real evangelical religion and devout piety as the army of Northern Virginia. Thousands of Southern soldiers submitted to water baptism. Dr. Jones writes that when the orders for moving came to A.P. Hill's Corps near Fredericksburg, they found chaplains J.J. Hyman and E.B. Barrett of Georgia engaged in baptizing in Massaponics Creek, some of the converts in the revival. On Sunday, June 29, 1863, near Hagerstown, Maryland, the banks of the historic Antietam were lined with an immense crowd of Confederate soldiers. But they came not in battle array, nor opposing host confronted them. No cannon belched its hoarse thunder, and the shriek of shell and the whistle of the many were unheard. Instead of these, sweet strains of the songs of Zion were waft on the breeze, and the deepest solemnity pervaded the gathered host as one of the chaplains led down into the historic stream fourteen veterans who a few months before had fought at Sharpsburg and were now enlisting under the banner of the cross. It is reported that General John B. Gordon attended the baptismal service of many converts within his ranks while being exposed to enemy fire. The Rapidan River, among many others, including many ponds, served as convenient sites for the ordinance of baptism for thousands of soldiers in gray that were following their Lord in outward testimony by their obedience to His Word. When orders came to march northward, To Gettysburg, Hyman was in the water baptizing 58 converts. The churches that were the most active in in providing gospel literature, Bibles and chaplains to travel with the army were the Baptist, Presbyterian, Methodist, and the Episcopal. The official publications of these churches were very actively engaged in soliciting funds for support to help sponsor the chaplains and to buy more gospel tracts and Bibles for the soldiers. Many of the soldiers themselves sent offerings out of their $11 a month salary to mission boards and Bible societies to buy literature for the soldiers in other camps. The Word of God was in the camp. There were scores of co-porters who were Bible and literature distributors. The spirit of revival, the consciousness of Christ as Savior, and the call of the Holy Spirit pervaded the army. A chaplain historian, in an evaluation of the Dalton 
evangelistic efforts wrote this, The work at Dalton while the army was there was almost without a parallel. In the coldest and darkest nights of winter, the rude chaplains were crowded. And at the call for pen, uh, penitence, hundreds came forward, down in sorrow and tears to the altar. Dalton was the spiritual birthplace of thousands. One of the most prominent Confederate chaplains that played a major part in spreading the gospel throughout the Southern armies was William W. Bennett. He held the position of superintendent of the Soldiers Track Association. In his book entitled Narrative of the Great Revival, which prevailed in the Southern armies, he stated this, up to January 1865, it was estimated that nearly 150,000 soldiers had been converted during the progress of the war, and it was believed that fully one-third of all the soldiers in the field were praying men and members of some branch of the Christian church. A large proportion of the higher officers were men of faith and prayer, and many others though not professedly religious, were moral, respectful to all the religious services, and confessed the value of the revival in promoting the efficiency of the army. Dr. J. William Jones in his record states that, according to his estimate, there were at least 50,000 converts in General Lee's army alone. It was reported by hospital staff, workers, ministers, officers and visitors that among many of the patients in the hospitals and convalescent houses, that strong conviction of sin would sweep over the soldiers. On many occasions, they would seek a minister to talk to or to pray with. Sometimes soldiers would spontaneously begin to praise and worship God or sing an old familiar hymn that would spread to many others in the house. In spite of the most deplorable conditions that existed in the northern prisons, such as Point Lookout, Fort Delaware, Elmira, and Johnson's Island, hundreds of southern soldiers found Christ as their Savior while confined to such prison, prison surroundings. Thousands of converts returned home, enrolled in Bible seminaries, and became pastors, evangelists, and started hundreds of Christian churches throughout the South. The chaplain historian J. William Jones wrote of the chaplains and their sermons. Whoever it is, he preaches the gospel. He does not discuss the relation of science to religion, or the slavery question, or the causes which led to the war itself. He does not indulge in abusive epithets of the invaders of our soil, or seek to fire his hearers with hatred or vindictiveness towards the enemy. He is looking in the eyes of heroes of many a battle, and knows that the long roll may beat in the midst of his sermon, and summon the men to battle and to death. And therefore he speaks as a dying man to dying men, talking with great earnestness the old, old story of salvation. There were many prayer meetings held throughout the camps in the Confederate Army. One writer from General Lee's army wrote that frequent prayer meetings have been held in the trenches, even on the advanced skirmish line, within easy musket range of the enemy. The song of praise and the voice of supplication have been heard. Sermons have also been preached in the trenches, albeit they have sometimes been cut short by the bursting of the shell or the whistling of the miniball. Bible distribution was welcomed. The Word of God, in the form of a pocket Bible or testament, was the first thing sought after, and the hymn book came next. But it was generally necessary only to show oneself with a pocket of tracts or religious papers in the corner of an encampment and begin to give them out, and you would be very soon surrounded by an eager crowd asking, for something to read. J. William Jones said of his own experience, I had a pair of large saddlebags which I used to pack with 
tracts and religious newspapers, and with Bibles and Testaments. Thus equipped, I would sally forth, and as I drew near the camp, someone would raise the cry, Yonder comes the Bible and track man. And such crowds would rush out to meet me that frequently I would sit on my horse and distribute my supply before I even got into the camp. The poor fellows would crowd around and beg for them as earnestly as if they were golden guineas. The Word of God was in the camp. One Cole Porter wrote, Many a time, officers and privates who made no profession of religion gathered around him at night, listening with undisguised pleasure to the reading of God's Word, and joined in the sweet old songs of Zion until the forest rang again with their grateful praise. The sanctuary was always crowded and loud. Animated singing always hailed his approach. All the soldiers leaned upon the voice of the preacher as if God Himself had called them together to hear of life and death eternal. There was preaching in the camp. Prayer meetings were held everywhere in the camps. Some meetings were conducted by officers, some by common soldiers as well as by ministers. They were held in the trenches, around campfires, in crudely constructed, constructed chapels, under trees, on the riverbanks, as well as in open fields. During the winter campaigns along the 40 miles of entrenchment, the soldiers built 60 chapels. There was enthusiastic singing of hymns such as, How Firm a Foundation, At the Cross, Am I a Soldier of the Cross, When I Can Read My Title Clear, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name, Amazing Grace, A Mighty Fortress, Just As I Am, and many other familiar hymns of the church. One of the most remarkable characteristics of this revival is the number of genuine Christian men that were among the highest ranking officers in the army. Many of the officers who distinguished themselves in heroic deeds of valor throughout the war were Christians from the outset. Some of the, the most well-known among them were Robert E. Lee, Stonewall Jackson, Kirby Smith, Jeb Stewart, W.N. Pendleton, and many others, too numerous to mention. In fact, General Stonewall Jackson sent money for his black Sunday school that he had established before the war. After the war, General Robert E. Lee accepted the presidency of the Rockbridge Bible Society of Lexington, Virginia, and as president of Washington College, which later became known as Washington and Lee College, he remarked to his, for, his former chaplain, Oh, doctor, if I could only know that all the young men in this college were good Christians, I should have nothing more to desire. Our great want is the revival which shall bring these young men to Christ. I should be disappointed, sir, and shall fail in the leading object that brought me here, unless these young men all become Christians. We poor sinners need to come back from our wanderings to seek pardon through the all-sufficient merits of our Redeemer. And we need to pray earnestly for the power of the Holy Spirit to give us a precious revival in our hearts and among the unconverted. What were the results of the revival? Well, Dr. Bennett closed his narratives of the revivals in 1877 with the question, what were the results or the fruits of the army revivals were they enduring? In all the churches of the South, there are earnest, devout, and active Christians who date their spiritual birth from some revival in Virginia, in the West, or in the Far South. When the tired fighting men of General Lee's Army of Northern Virginia laid down their arms and furled their glorious flag 
for the last time at Appomattox, Virginia, admitting military defeat. Little did they realize that within them God had won a great spiritual victory for His people and for the survival of this great nation. What a loss they suffered on the battlefield, but what a victory they had won at their altars. In the mind of our omniscient God, He knew that a standard of righteousness had to be raised in the face of the flood of political and economic corruption, moral debauchery, intellectual and philosophical atheism, and spiritual infidelity that would arise during the last half of the 19th century and would persist even to this present day. Isaiah, that great prophet of old, prophesied that when the enemy shall come in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. The revival in the Confederate Army, where approximately a hundred to a hundred and fifty thousand men were converted to Christ, is one of the greatest revivals that took place in this nation, but yet it is one of the least known. But it had more effect in maintaining a Christian consensus in the minds of our people, especially those of the South, than any other revival. We can thank God for His mercy and His sovereign power in sending that spiritual refreshing to our people at the darkest hour of our existence as a nation. There was no one great revivalist, but it was the sovereign power of the Holy Ghost that moved among our people to preserve us a Christian culture in this country, both the North and in the South. God bless you. For greater understanding on this subject, on this program we are offering two items. A video which runs 58 minutes and 30 seconds entitled The Spiritual Revival in the Confederate Army. Very informative, very well done. Also a book entitled Cultures in Conflict that tells about the, the desecration of the churches in the South during the war. Both of these items for $15. Just contact our ministry by phone, email, etc., and we'll be glad to send these to you for an offering of $15. God bless you. Thank you very much. For any material offered on this program or to be a part of this ministry, please write or call today. We thank you. And may God bless you for your response to this end time ministry, Truth in History, where the Word of God is not bound.